first of all, let me show you this ad. When uh, he talked about Demery, uh, this ad, some of the material that we need to verify uh, the historians and, and recollections are found actually the primary sources uh, that I have relied on are these ads. This is one about Demery, the one we talked about who, who was free. And you can see here that this ad was placed by a free black man who was accusing him of stealing his papers. <laughs> you see, I kept wondering, why would he, this man do this? Well, all the free black people, you see, everybody's not on the same page, <laughs> even in appearance. So here was a free black man who was afraid that he would be implicated in this uh, affair. So he was making it known to the public that if he's caught and he has uh, the, when you say free papers, are basically court documents indicating that he's free, he stole them from me, I had nothing to do with it. That was the climate. It helps you a lot to understand the climate of fear and the people who actually did participate, what they were really up against. Because here's a man, who, this is an ad by a free black man, and he said that, anyway, he, he's in possession of my free papers. And I wanted to also give you a picture of the county in the 1840s and how the population had changed. So you can see just quickly that there, there was a slight increase in the percentage of people in, the, in this county who were black from 1820 to 1840. And that was mostly due to the influx of free black people into Guilford County. One of the reasons many came from Virginia, many free blacks came from Virginia south into North Carolina because the living conditions for free black people in North Carolina were better than they were in Virginia. And many of free blacks stayed in North Carolina. One of my church in Alabama asked me why. I said, well, primarily because of property and because of family. Because most of them were not free because their fathers were slave masters, but they were free because they had bought their freedom. They were given opportunities to work and save, and they bought their freedom, and they bought property. And even though North Carolina outlawed even the presence of free blacks in the state in the 1830s because of the Nat Turner Rebellion, the population actually increased. So some of the laws that were passed were unenforceable. Like James was saying that free blacks were not allowed to testify in court, but they did. And the court record says that they did. They testified in court. They testified against white people. They did a lot of things that the law technically did not allow, but it was allowed in this county. So I want you to see that by 1840, 20% of the black people in this county were free. That's what, that's what really those numbers show. It shows an increase in the percentage. And as that percentage increased, so did Underground Railroad activity. Look at this. Okay, this is another one you can't read, but I want you to see, this is when you do the research, what you have to do, I have to read these, and then I type up the next one. This is a, uh, an ad that directly ties fugitive slaves and their escape to Newburgh. As one of the, when I found this ad, I was so excited. I said, finally I have something other than the reminiscences of Addison and Levi Coffin to establish the reality that the, there were two things here, that it happened in Newburgh, and secondly, the role played by both the Quakers and by free blacks. You see that he's a blacksmith and, and so forth. And the Melvin family is also still in the area. And Sarah Melvin had four slaves. So by losing one, it was a serious problem for her. And go to the next one, please, Jane. And at the same time, in 1843, this is where I wanted to focus uh, this afternoon, I found actually when Erickson found this letter, Gwen has been the key to my success in many ways because she finds little known documents in the Friends uh, historical collection. And she found this letter in the, in the papers of uh, Joseph Dixon. And the letter is written by one of his friends, 
And she is talking about a case that shook up the Quakers and its community. And I'm going to um, hopefully keep, I, I'll try to keep your attention. Um, I want you to hear this letter. Because this letter illustrates a lot of issues that were a major component of the Underground Railroad in this area. The Quakers were not of one accord, to put it mildly. And she says, I write with an aching heart to her two friends. Because I have kept school just two months and I quit today. Had you heard of the uproar there is in this part of the country? This was the uproar. There was a, un, a runaway slave harbored at a friend's house in Deep River. And a friend knew that he would have to suffer for it. He just absconded until after court, which was the next week. So in time of court, there was a great many friends called to be examined about all that had been done in that respect in the last five years. Now among those calls, she says, were Dugan Clark and Joshua Stanley. The Quakers, excuse me, the coffins are gone off the scene. Other Quakers are involved. Dugan Clark and Joshua Stanley were both Nathan Hunt's sons-in-law. And they were also superintendents of New Garden Boarding School. First Dugan Clark and then Joshua Stanley. And can you imagine, they were, they were called a court. Along with her father, John Cooper, and she said several of the slains. And oh, what an uproar it created. But my father came home clear at the time. Well, she said after that, the man came back and went to the magistrate and accused her father of helping, which was a mistake. He thought it was the only way to save his life, because there was more involved here than just your fortune. And sometimes people were put out on the stocks and tarred and feathered here in Greensboro for participating in anti-slavery activities, even for preaching to the slaves, even for teaching the enslaved people. There are many cases, tar and feather, 39 lashes downtown in front of the courthouse. So, anyway, so he thought he'd put it on others, and all he had to go upon was this. This is what she said happened. The runaway went to the man's house and wanted help. Well, the man wrote a letter to father to meet another friend at his house and tell him what to do for the best. He said in the letter he thought the runaway ought to be helped. She said that her father didn't go to the meeting and father didn't want to help. She said, but then the man sent the Negro here. The father told him it would not do. But he, the Negro, went to Richard Ladd to get him a to get a free paper for him. Now, who was Richard Ladd? Richard Ladd was a free black man, and her father had stood as bondsman for Richard Ladd when Richard Ladd married Archibald Curry's daughter. It turns up in my haste, when I first got up, in my confusion with the slides, I didn't say, but I think I should, that the network who helped people escape from slavery was made up of people who knew each other beforehand. They were already friends. They were already associates. All over the country, this has been the case. Networks of people who already knew each other were working together, and they were only loosely connected to other networks. So when you study the Underground Railroad, you're not just studying the activities to help runaway slaves, but you're also studying interrelationships among people that were quite surprising to me when I started this study. I was quite surprised to see how many free black people lived in this area, like the Currys lived in Horse Pen Creek area. In the Horse Pen Creek area, there were quite a few free black people who owned property all around this area. Free black people owned property, substantial amounts of property, and they bought most of their property from Quakers. So father found out and told dad not to do a thing. But somehow, this is how the letter, I, I laughed when I read this. Somehow the slave got a free paper that belonged to one of Richard's brothers. Then Richard got uneasy about it and went to get it from him but could not. They didn't have the, what, Facebook, internet, <laughs> <laughs> the tweets. So the fact that this, this letter that it got out to it was totally illegal. 
she uh, got she got father to go and try to, to, try to uh, she got he got her father to try to get the papers. The language is a little convoluted, so I'm trying to make it clear. So father went to the man's house and called for the Negro. But the man still wanted him to conceal him, but father just said to him, D is running at great risk in keeping him and discouraged him. But the man kept him there seven months, unknown to my father. After that, and just because father went there, he puts it on him. He tells her father said he must be helped. Now she says, on Richard Bass may have. In other words, her father, and Rich, because he had a relationship with Richard Ladd, he was bondsman for Richard Ladd's marriage. They didn't have marriage licenses in those days. You had to have a bondsman to verify that you were a good person and you could marry this woman. So they, were, they had a close relationship. So because of that, the father went with him to, to take the fugitive to jail, she said. But the man got away. So she's saying that in her letter, that my father and Richard Ladd took the, took the fugitive slave who'd been hiding in this man's house in Big River. And on the way to jail, somehow the man got away. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going to Indiana. <laughs> so she said, now on father's behalf, there are so many false tales of prison that he has been advised to leave the country, which is meant the county, rather than suffer unjustly here. Next week, being court, he has gone with Horace Cannon to the Indiana. So her father had that. The court was coming up tomorrow. Her father was gone. He started yesterday. He left word for us to follow him. Father has sold his land and personal property altogether for $2,000 and bought land in Indiana. And so I found Richard Ladd, as I said, <coughs> in the marriage records. And I also found out that by 1850, Richard Ladd had also gone to Indiana. There's a large uh, African-American settlement in the county of Indiana. I don't know where Bax is, but Indiana was not a safe state for black You see what I'm saying? I'm from Ohio. <laughs>
man risked his life. To me, they are just as essential. They didn't leave um, like the coffins. They didn't leave their um, reminiscences or write books. But clearly, they sustained this effort here in this area. They and the Swains and other families are trying to unearth more so we get a better sense of the widespread uh, support, especially Deep River and where James has worked out in, in Burlington and uh, Snow Camp. And I want to end because uh, even though I'm in the Pentecostal church, and, and we never end our services. <laughs> <laughs> Blacks and enslaved, as seeing them more as partners, and seeing everyone involved as taking a risk. Especially, I think we forget sometimes about the Society of Friends being a very engaged group, not speaking with all one voice. So, James, there another slide. Oh yeah, from the yearly meeting minutes, 1843. There's a collection from 1835 to 1846 of the minutes of the yearly meeting. And one of those minutes, which uh, Gwen didn't show me that she's getting the whole collection, she started looking through it. One of them written in 1843 illustrates the way I want to go this with a question for you to think about. This is what they wrote. And I think it was in, obviously in response to the court case that Ms. Hubbard was talking about, that involved her father and who were part of Joshua Stanley and the Swains. Whereas it is well known to some of the Society of Friends that they do not allow their members to hold slaves or in any way to interfere with the system of slavery further than by petition, reason, or demonstrance in a peaceable manner. <coughs> and having through report now, this is what they were referring to about this case. And having through report come to the body of the society that someone or more of the members thereof have suffered themselves to be so far overcome through sympathy, as Jane can say, empathy or sympathy, as to allow and give shelter improperly to one or more slaves and thus occasion several of their fellow members to be accused of the like improper conduct. We have therefore thought it due to ourselves and to the people at large of the country in which we live, thus to make known our long established practice and utter disapproval of such interference in any way whatsoever, while at the same time we do not in the least agree to relinquish our testimony to the injustice of slavery. This is what the minutes, the minutes said. We oppose slavery, but we also oppose doing anything illegal to undermine slavery. We did not 